all of us who are here tonight have an interest in history. The history of the Civil War, the history of the U.S. Army, military history in general. But institutions have histories of their own. And our institution, the Army Heritage and Education Center, has a 42-year history dating back to our founding in the summer of 1967 as the Army Military History Research Collection. It was the dream, the inspired dream, of Colonel George S. Pappas. And this is a portrait photo of Colonel Pappas. He began with a staff of himself, one librarian, one secretary, and two rooms in Upton Hall. And from that beginning, he transformed his dream into the reality that we are experiencing and enjoying here and that people have benefited from for over four decades now. On January 5th, Colonel Pappas passed away. He had just celebrated his 90th birthday. He was still living at home. Every day, he walked downtown into the center of Tiburon, California, to his office, which he had appointed as tastefully as he had appointed the original military history research collection. I know some of the folks here tonight actually knew Colonel Pappas, but all of us should know of him because what we can benefit from through AHEC is the result of Colonel Pappas transforming his dream into the reality that we have here. And I ask that we pause for a moment of silent remembrance of Colonel George S. Pappas. May God rest his soul. One of the things that Colonel Pappas established among many was the Perspectives in Military History Lecture Series. We had been operating for barely a year when he created that series in the autumn of 1968. Another of his innovations came four years later in the summer of 1972 with the General Harold Keith Johnson visiting professorship of military history. And when we have a program that brings in a distinguished scholar to occupy the Johnson chair, it obviously makes great sense to invite that scholar to give a perspectives lecture. And we have been doing that throughout the hi history of the perspectives program, and we are continuing it tonight with the current incumbent, uh, Dr. Mark Grimsley who I have been assured uh, is here tonight. I don't see Mark, but I, I accept as an article of faith. Oh, you're Mark Grimsley. Ah, that's right. And what kind of tie do you have under there? Yes, I, 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 I see. All right. Bit too close in uh, for, for the, the broad overview sometimes uh, misses things in the, in the front rank. Not always the best place to be in a line of battle, but... Uh, one gets the glory that, that, that way, Mark. Mark is the uh, uh, pioneering uh, in the, the chair in several respects. Uh, uh, the first time that it has uh, been uh, physically and administratively situated in Root Hall uh, in the Dennis uh, Department. And Mark also uh, is the first one to have held the chair uh, for a two-year incumbency. He spoke in our perspective series uh, last year, and we are both pleased and honored uh, that he again is speaking in perspectives uh, tonight. Uh, he's currently decided that he's going to deal with a real war, the, the civil war, and will be uh, focusing on generalship in the overland campaign of 1864. Please join me in welcoming uh, Mark Grimsley uh, to give our perspectives lecture tonight. <laughs> 
be okay. Okay, good. Uh, let me begin with a, an administrative announcement. Um, I've done this before, but it's always prudent to do it again. Uh, as, a, as a speaker, I tend to be informal and animated, and uh, I do this with my students. Sometimes I do it here. And sometimes I get you know, too informal and too animated, and when that occurs, well, we have a uh, precautionary measure in place. The rule of my students is I am allowed the occasional damn or hell to punctuate whatever it is that I'm saying. But if I say anything stronger, the first person to raise their hand gets a dollar bill. And back at Ohio State, this next part is, is played for laughs, but uh, since I'm here at the Army War College around a lot of colonels and so forth, you know, who have been downrange maybe a few too many times, uh, the, um, the other rule is that if I drop the F-bomb, then whoever raises their hand gets $20. Now, last year I was in real danger of this occurring because Seminar 16, with which I'm affiliated, was a hard-swearing bunch last year. This year, not quite so much, perhaps because we have a chaplain among uh, students. So, you know, hopefully uh, we will avert uh, disaster uh, this evening. But if not, the money is already sitting out, um, <laughs> ready to go. It's a privilege and an honor to be here uh, this evening. Uh, the Military History Institute is a, is a, is a tremendous uh, resource. Uh, so is uh, AHEC. I've been availing myself of its facilities now since I was 20 years old. I just turned 50, so it's been a long, it's been a long time. My talk this evening is based upon uh, my book, And Keep Moving On, The Virginia Campaign, May, June, 1864, which was published in 2002. You know, it's really not the best title for a Civil War book, I realize in retrospect. It doesn't include the words Lincoln or Gettysburg or something like the first duel between Grant and Lee or even the Overland Campaign, a term that at least most Civil War buffs would find familiar. I don't know why the marketing people let me get away with it. And Keep Moving On harkens back to Grant's famous precept, the art of war is simple enough, find out where your enemy is, get at him as soon as you can, strike at him as hard as you can and as often as you can, and keep moving on. The Virginia campaign in the subtitle acknowledges the fact that this, this operation was actually much larger than the Overland Campaign, and that Overland Campaign refers to the fighting between the Union Army of the Potomac and the Confederate Army of Northern Virginia. The Virginia campaign encompasses not just that operation, but a number of subsidiary operations, particularly in the Bermuda Hundred uh, region between Richmond and Petersburg, and I'll be talking about that this evening. That said, Gordon Ray, the author of a distinguished multi-volume history of the Overland Campaign, has called my book the best single-volume history of the Overland Campaign yet published, which is a real compliment, and I appreciate it a great deal. Plus, it's required reading for officers in the Basic Strategic Arts Program, uh, which is co-located with the Army War College as preparation for a multi-day staff ride of the battlefields over which the campaign was fought. How many, how many B-sappers do we have in the room tonight? Okay, good. Good turnout. I know we have at least one former B-sapper in the room. On top of that, here's the book. And January 20th, just celebrated Martin Luther King Day. What's the next holiday coming up? Nothing says thinking of you like death and destruction. Well, vast as it was, the campaign encompassed almost uh, the entire state of uh, Virginia. The campaign was part of an even larger set of concentric offensives organized by Ulysses S. Grant when he took command of all Union armies in March 1864. Grant's overall scheme involved this. First, a campaign chiefly run by the Army of the Potomac aimed at destroying Lee's army, not capturing Richmond, Virginia, but destroying Lee's army. Secondly, to break up Joe Johnston's Army of Tennessee, 
uh, in uh, northern Georgia. And then finally, as part of both campaigns, to destroy as many Confederate war resources uh, as possible. If you look at Grant's scheme, you'll see that it involved uh, offensives in Virginia, a second major offensive in northern Georgia aimed at Joe Johnston's army and at Atlanta, a uh, major industrial and rail, rail center. And then Grant had in mind uh, another campaign under Major General Nathaniel P. Banks aimed uh, at Mobile, Alabama. But for political reasons, Banks went that away instead. Uh, up the Red River Valley of Louisiana in the direction of uh, Texas, partly in order to uh, try and uh, get at Texas and the Unionist sentiment there, partly in order to get a hold of uh, uh, major cotton trade uh, in that region. This was emphatically not in accord with Grant's uh, wishes, but it provides an indication of the political nature of the war and the way in which even uh, the North's foremost military commander uh, could not make everything go the way that uh, he wanted it to. Indeed, neither the Overland Campaign itself was conducted in the way that Grant wanted it. In fact, Grant did not want to conduct an Overland Campaign at all. Uh, two months before Grant took charge of all the Union armies, his predecessor, uh, Major General William Halleck, this guy here, Henry Wager, sorry, Henry Wager Halleck here, still the general in chief, uh, asked, invited Grant to come up with an offensive plan against General Robert E. Lee's Army of Northern Virginia up in uh, uh, Virginia. And Grant proposed a radical new plan whereby an army of 60,000 men would leave from the vicinity of Suffolk, Virginia, and then would advance against the Weldon Railroad, which is, runs along here. The Weldon Railroad was a, a major line of communication, a major supply artery between Richmond and Lee's Army of Northern Virginia and the Deep South. And Grant's reasoning was you cut that rail artery and then another one farther to the west, and you would simply force Lee's uh, Army willy-nilly out of Virginia and into the more open country of North Carolina, where it would be easier to, to fight on advantageous uh, terms. Halleck, however, vetoed the plan, doubtless with Lincoln's blessing, uh, if not absolute insistence. A column of 60,000 men, Halleck uh, told Grant, could only come from the Union Army of the Potomac, whose mission was not only to attack Lee's army, but also to shield Washington. And Halleck feared with reason that Lee would respond not by retreating, as Grant expected, but by seizing the opportunity to invade the North. Lee had done so in 1862, he had done it again in 1863, and he was in fact hoping to do it again in 1864. He's on record as having said so. And since 1864 was a presidential election year, even a brief invasion could have calamitous political consequences. And so as a result, Grant was directed to keep the Army of the Potomac positioned between Lee's army and Washington, to assume the overland route against Lee's army in Virginia, and hence the name of the campaign. As finally devised, Lee, Grant set in motion not just the main offensive by the Army of the Potomac against Lee's Army of, the, uh, Army of Northern Virginia, but also no fewer than four subsidiary offensives designed to support the main offensive and, if possible, divert reinforcements that would otherwise go to, to reinforce uh, Lee's Army. And these included two raids against the Virginia and Tennessee Railroad here in southwestern uh, Virginia, uh, an advance up the, uh, the Shenandoah Valley by General Franz Siegel, of whom the less said, the better. And then finally, a major thrust uh, by an army coming from the direction of Hampton Roads in Norfolk under the command of Major General Benjamin F. Butler. We're going to talk rather a lot about uh, Butler. Butler's job was to, uh, to, uh, to go up the James River estuary uh, land at a peninsula called Bermuda Hundred and threaten the Confederate capital of 
Richmond. Now, this thrust up the James River, River uh, estuary would be in the hands of Butler, who was a so-called political general. And if you, you know, if you ever study the Civil War, you know, this, we say political general with a hint of scorn because they're always awful people who had no business wearing a general's shoulder straps as if all the West Pointers were highly competent uh, uh, commanders. Butler was indeed a political general. His only pre-war experience had been as, the, as a general uh, of the Massachusetts militia. Uh, he was nonetheless the third-ranking general in the entire Union Army, thanks to his political importance. By the way, that is General Butler uh, right up there. Butler had been a prominent pre-war Democrat, had in fact placed Jefferson Davis his name in nomination for the Democratic uh, uh, presidential uh, nomination in 1860, something he never lived down for the rest of his life. And it was important to Lincoln that when the war began to, to gain as much bipartisan support as he could possibly get. And so a prominent Democrat uh, like Butler was quite likely to get uh, commissioned as, uh, as a general. And as I may have said, Butler's the third-ranking general in the entire Union Army in 1864. Now, Butler had actually done very well as an administrator of occupied southern territory. This is a talent that can be underestimated. This was, after all, a civil war, and it presented complex political challenges that only a gifted politician could understand and navigate successfully. So people who like to rag on Butler, just, you know, they don't get a, a, a cheer from me. I, I have more respect for Butler than, uh, than for most. It's also important to keep Butler militarily active uh, during 1864. Otherwise, believe it or not, Butler, who did in fact look exactly like this fellow, uh, was considered to be a potential presidential candidate. There's even some evidence that Lincoln sounded him out as a potential running mate. Uh, Butler, according to his own report, turned it down, uh, basically thought that uh, he, he said he would take the job only if Lincoln guaranteed to drop dead within six months of the inauguration, if only he had known. Well, Grant met with Butler in early April down around Fort Monroe, Virginia, and discovered that Butler had independently conceived a thrust the James River estuary. And Grant liked the idea. He understood that Butler had limited combat experience, which was true. Uh, and so, as one of Butler's two corps commanders for this operation, he named Major General William F. Smith right here. And Grant figured that Smith could provide Butler with the necessary military advice. And Grant thought that, that Smith was entirely capable of doing this because at this particular time, Grant considered Smith to be perhaps the North's most brilliant uh, general uh, officer. The trouble is, Smith also thought he was the North's most brilliant officer. And you can just imagine how he felt about working under Butler. And you can also imagine how a general of Butler's formidable ego felt about taking military advice from Smith. Plus, Smith didn't believe in the operation. He saw all kinds of trouble uh, with an offensive up the James River estuary. And so, you know, this, this operation then uh, had some serious problems from uh, the start. Uh, Butler would have indeed 30,000 troops. He was reinforced to 30,000 troops, would take them up at the same time that Meade launched his offensive, would take transports up the James River estuary would land them at uh, the Bermuda 100 Peninsula. It looks like a beckoning uh, finger uh, right there. Uh, this would be, he would have two corps commanders, one uh, Smith, the other one a guy named Quincy Gilmore. Uh, and together, their job, as, as Grant explained it, was to move up this bank, the right-hand bank, or the westernmost bank of the James River, uh, and threaten Richmond. Grant didn't actually expect Butler to capture Richmond, but he did expect Grant to put enough pressure on Richmond to prevent reinforcements from reaching Lee and ideally perhaps even to detach some troops uh, to reinforce 
uh, Richmond's defenses. And by the way, if Butler, if there's something about Butler that looks familiar to you and you just you can't quite place where you've seen him before. That's basically it. NYPD Blue. So, yeah. Andy Sipowitz. So, in short, for the Virginia campaign, Grant expected to have not one, but two partners in command. The obvious partner in command, Major General George G. Meade, here in the center, the victor of Gettysburg, commander of the 120,000 man uh, Army of the Potomac, and then Butler commanding the 30,000-man Army of the James. And it's clear that Butler, sorry, that Grant regarded Butler's army as constituting informally the right wing of, left wing, of the um, Army of the Potomac. And that as Meade's army neared Richmond, it would link up with Butler's army. In the meantime, Butler was to threaten Richmond aggressively enough to divert those reinforcements that might otherwise have gone to Lee's 65,000-man Army of Northern Virginia, and then the offenses in the Shenandoah Valley, southwestern Virginia, also supposed to achieve the same purpose. This is the command arrangement uh, in Virginia, the main... Uh, the Army of the Potomac and the Army of the James uh, at the beginning of the operation, on the eve of the operation, May 4th, 1864. Grant chose to accompany uh, Meade's Army of the Potomac directly. And in fact, his headquarters were habitually co-located right along with Meade's uh, headquarters. And indeed, Grant supervised Meade's Army so closely that he occasionally gave orders directly to Meade's subordinates. And reporters soon dubbed the Army of the, Poten Army of the Potomac Grant's Army. And that's, that's what it's been known to history as ever since. It was an awkward command relationship. For one thing, Grant and Meade had very different command styles. Meade tended to be systematic, if not outright cautious. Grant, on the other hand, was more inclined to be aggressive and improvisational. And Grant consistently found it difficult to use Meade's army to respond as rapidly as he as the armies that Grant had commanded and had known out in the Western theaters. So constantly he would give orders, expecting the Army of the Potomac to move rapidly, and the Army of the Potomac would always be a half day late, a day late, and a dollar short. Uh, worse, operating with the Army of the Potomac was an independent corps, the Ninth Corps, under the command of Major General Ambrose E. Burnside. An independent corps simply because Burnside outranked Meade and had once commanded the Army of the Potomac, as many of you uh, know and as many of the troops of the Army of the Potomac learned to their uh, personal extinction uh, in December of 1862. Then, too, integral to Grant's plan was another independent army under Butler here with two corps. And so, thus, you have a total of seven corps controlled by three different commanders with Grant, the sole officer, able to direct all of them. This was an awkward command relationship. Grant would wind up rationalizing it to some degree by doing something that Burnside had told him from the very beginning that he could do. Burnside was, you know, was actually a good man, willing to be subordinate, willing to work under Meade. And about after the first couple of weeks of the campaign, uh, Burnside's corps was consolidated with the Army of the Potomac, and that problem went away. But the idea of Butler uh, exercising an independent campaign, uh, uh, independent command, and being controllable only by Grant. Uh, that problem or that issue uh, continued uh, throughout the campaign. Now, as we're going to see, Grant chose to conduct the campaign using maximum use, making maximum use of Union sea power. As the Army of the Potomac and the Army of the James advanced, they relied upon northern shipping to keep supplied. Butler established a major base at Bermuda 100, and Grant uh, and Meade utilized a succession of bases along several river estuaries uh, 
This is a photograph of the first of these at Belle Plain on the Potomac River. Not only did supplies flow in this way, but also tens of thousands of wounded men and captured POWs flowed out uh, in the same kind of a way, so that at the height of the campaign, Grant was using up nearly all of the available shipping on the entire eastern seaboard. Gives you an idea of the scale of the campaign uh, that he was conducting. The next two slides will give you an idea of the logistical challenge involved. And this is, this is true for the Union Army. It's true for the Confederate Army as well. Assuming an average strength of 100,000 men, the Army of the Potomac required about 100,000 pounds of meat and 100,000 pounds of hardtack this hard cracker here, to say nothing of additional food supplies, ammunition, and other equipment every single day. The Army actually drove along with it herds of, uh, uh, entire herds of cattle to be slaughtered peri periodically and distributed to the troops. The Confederates utilized railroads to meet their own supply needs, which tended to average about half of what the Union troops received but, you know, but simply because the Confederate Army had less meat, less hardtack available, and so forth. So. so you're dealing with a tremendous amount of supplies on both sides. But that is nothing compared to the other component of a 19th century army, and that is the horses and the mules. Supplying the men was a comparatively minor task compared with that of supplying the sum 115,000 horses and mules required directly or indirectly to support the armies of the Potomac and the Army of Northern Virginia. Now before we get to the campaign itself, it's imperative to examine one of the hallmarks of the campaign, both in Virginia and in Georgia, and for that matter everywhere else by 1864, the extensive use of field fortifications. Now these have been used before. Uh, the use of field fortifications goes all the way back to the Battle of Big, uh, to the first engagement of the war, Big Bethel, in June of 1861. They had been used at various other places, but the use of field fortifications during the campaigns of 1864-1865 became uh, habitual and used on a scale never before uh, seen in previous Civil War operations. And this is basically what the uh, an entrenched line uh, looked like. You would clear out an area ahead of, uh, of the position, and then you would, you would lay the trees down uh, with the, the branches facing the enemy to create something that the French called abati, which was sort of a, before you had barbed wire, this had the same kind of function. Troops kind of trying to come over the abati would get tangled, and it would take time for them to get across it. And then, of course, they would have to cross this open uh, area, good field of fire. There were, and then what would happen is the troops... Uh, would dig uh, uh, would dig dirt out of this area and dig dirt out of out of this area and create an earthen breastwork going along here, and then they would put a head log across the top, and the head log would have just enough clear uh, cleared space so that let's say that you know here is the top of the entrenchment, and then I've got some kind of small log crossways here, and then I've got the head log here. What that means is I've got just enough room to be able to shoot at the bad guys, and my head literally is protected by uh, the head log. So that's essentially how the system worked. And you could also put tarpaulins and so forth over the trenches to shield yourself from the sun uh, and that kind of a thing. Both sides used these field fortifications extensively. Uh, the, the soldiers by this time didn't even have to be ordered uh, to use them. When they stopped, they would habitually uh, begin to entrench using anything at hand, shovels, mess pans, whatever it took uh, to, to build uh, these field fortifications because they had come to understand in the marrow of their bones by this time uh, that these fortifications were uh, real lifesavers. And these, by the way, are some reconstructed field works at Spotsylvania Courthouse. So this was taken last spring. Uh, these are members of the uh, Basic Strategic Arts Program uh, officers at that particular uh, time. 
uh, they're standing, and you know, here we have the uh, the entrenchments looking at it sideways. Another sideways view here. Um, here we have the, uh, the the dugout portion. It's more shallow than it would have been. Uh, essentially, these are you know reconstructed uh, field works on the same spot as the, the field works in the, uh, during the actual battle. Those have eroded. There hasn't been an attempt to dig down any deeper. And then you've got the entire group of uh, uh, bee sappers uh, here, uh, you know, just waiting for me to take uh, take their picture. And what, and what a handsome lot uh, they are. Fighting between Grant and Lee was characterized by near continuous operations, a rarity during the Civil War when it was common for armies to clash furiously for a few hours, maybe for a day, two, three days maximum, but then to withdraw from one another for days or even weeks. And during those periods when the armies were apart, the soldiers had an opportunity to recuperate psychologically and, uh, and physically. Uh, but the Overland Campaign was not like this. Soldiers went for 40 days with little respite from the threat of death and wounds. And when the armies paused, as they did several times for several days, um, you know, the, the bodies uh, you know, could, not be, could not be attended to, could not be buried. They began to decompose. They began to, they began to, to smell. This had potent effects on health. It had potent effects on, uh, you know, the, the, uh, on the, the psychology of the troops involved, particularly since you know, the, the troops who lay uh, dead out in front of them were often their, their neighbors. Uh, their friends, uh, sometimes their, their loved ones, uh, and, uh, and so forth. So it was really just a horrendous uh, experience that the 40 days of the Overland Campaign uh, comprised. The first of these major uh, battles that comprise the, uh, the Overland Campaign occurs as soon as the Union Army of the Potomac crosses the Rapidan uh, River in north-central uh, Virginia. This is what it looks like uh, nowadays. As soon as they had crossed uh, the river, practically, uh, Lee pitched into them with as much of his army as he could bring to bear. The two armies fought uh, in the wilderness uh, for two days. Uh, federal casualties uh, were greater than the Confederate casualties. And, in fact, the federal casualties were worse uh, than, or at least as bad, as they had been the previous year at the Battle of Chancellorsville, which was fought in the same general area and had resulted in a Union retreat. Uh, on May, uh, the evening of May uh, 7th, Grant broke off contact from Lee's army and began to, with, with, to seemingly withdraw uh, to the east away from Lee's army and eventually reached uh, a crossroads. And the troops uh, that were marching along knew that if the army took the left-hand crossroad, it would be heading back toward the Rapidan River uh, and safety. What it would mean is that the campaign had failed. But what happened instead was that the army took the right-hand crossroads, which meant that it was heading south, which meant that they were heading back into battle, which also meant was that the campaign was still underway, that Grant was not beaten, that Grant was taking them back in for another major uh, battle. And the troops cheered when they realized the army was going back south to continue the fight. Uh, and the cheers inspired everybody except for Grant, which was like, hey, trying to steal a march on the enemy, shut these guys up. So, this is a wartime print made at the time of the troops cheering Grant. And you can see Jan Grant there kind of looking bemusedly at them. Um, that same, the same uh, uh, image was turned into the 1990 Army War College class, the, the Army War College class of 1990 class print. You can see it on display at Root Hall. It was actually the image uh, with which I began the uh, uh, the presentation uh, this evening, and it's really one of the great inspirational moments uh, in American military uh, history. For the next 10 days, from May 8th through the 18th, Grant and Lee fought it out at Spotsylvania Courthouse, a few miles south of the Wilderness Battlefield. And this is the point at which uh, Grant made the famous announcement, I intend to fight it out along this line if it takes all summer. 
And the logic behind what Grant was saying is that he believed that Butler's uh, army was pinning Grant from, uh, sorry, pinning uh, Confederate reinforcements from reaching Lee, that Franz Siegel in the Shenandoah Valley was preventing reinforcements from reaching Lee, that those two subsidiary offensives against the South, uh, the Virginia and Tennessee Railroad were preventing reinforcements from reaching Lee, and therefore, if he just continued to put pressure on Lee, Lee's army, without reinforcements, would be overmatched and could eventually be overwhelmed and destroyed. Unfortunately, things didn't work out this way. Butler did indeed maneuver for 10 days, threatening Richmond. And for a good deal of that time, he was able to prevent any number, you know, tens of thousands really, of of uh, Confederate reinforcements from reaching Lee's Army of Northern Virginia. But his own military inexperience, coupled with an abysmal relationship between his two chief subordinates, William Smith and Quincy Gilmore, all but ensured that Butler would not come close to capturing Richmond. And finally, on, on May 16th, while Grant was still at Spotsylvania, a Confederate counterattack under General G.T. Beauregard forced Butler back into his fortified line at the neck of the Bermuda Hundred uh, Peninsula. And once that was done, uh, Beauregard sealed off the neck of the peninsula with uh, a line of fortifications of his own, and from then on, reinforcements were available to go north to help Lee's Army in Northern Virginia. And at about the same time, Grant got word that um, uh, Siegel had met defeat at the Battle of New Market in the Shenandoah Valley, and those two raids out in southwestern Virginia had come to nothing. And so this made fighting it out at Spotsylvania no longer a good idea. And so Grant again resorted to maneuver, always to the east, always to the east so as to preserve his seaborne line of communications. Lee, as usual, got to the next defensive line, this time on the south bank of the North Anna River, shown here. And this is from a, a staff ride uh, taken by the uh, Basic Strategic Arts Program officers last uh, spring. That is uh, Mike Matheny, if I'm not mistaken, uh, pointing out, that, saying that you know, this is a sign. Look at it. And how many, people, how many people have been to the North Anna battlefield? If you have not, only a portion of the battlefield is uh, is left. A bunch of it is now a quarry, but the people who created the quarry cut a deal with the Civil War Preservation Trust and basically said, okay, fine, look, we're going to make a quarry out of this. We've got a perfect right to do it, but we understand the historical significance of this area. Pick the most historically significant part of this battlefield. We will, at our own expense, create a park. You know, we will preserve things. You know, which part will you pick? And the... The Civil War Battle, uh, Preservation Trust picked the Oxford sector, which is, uh, which if you have not been, you absolutely need to go. Was there serious fighting there? Not so much. However, for whatever reason, the Confederate earthworks that are preserved there are in almost pristine shape. The erosion has taken very little toll on them. And if you want to get an idea of what a Civil, Civil War uh, uh, earthwork system looked like, there is really almost no better place to go uh, than to uh, the Oxford portion of the North Anna River battlefield. So that's where uh, the, the BSAP group uh, was at uh, back in the spring. And if you look down from uh, uh, their vantage point, you're looking down uh, the bluff at the North Anna River. And this position really was so uh, so well held by the uh, the Confederates and so cunningly that after three days of conclusive inconclusive maneuvers, Grant tried again to get around Lee's flank. This culminated in the battles of Cold Harbor fought on June 1st and again on June 3rd. Union efforts to break through the Confederate lines by that time just a few miles away from uh, Richmond. So these were frontal assaults. Uh, they were made with an, with an understanding that they were quite likely to fail. But if they succeeded, if they succeeded, there was nothing between the Confederate Army and Richmond, and you'd be punching right through uh, Lee's Army of Northern Virginia, and had a very good chance of destroying it. So it was a it was a calculated risk. It turned out to be uh, 
poorly calculated, as it turned out, it's extensive uh, 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 union uh, union casualties, and that really was the end of the Overland campaign proper. Having run out of room to maneuver, Grant abandoned the Overland campaign and began a new campaign aimed at the railroad choke point of Petersburg, some 15 miles uh, directly south of Richmond. This was really an attempt to repeat on a smaller scale Grant's original campaign scheme, the this, this scheme that involved uh, bypassing Richmond and bypassing Lee's Army, Northern Virginia, and going straight at the railroad line of uh, the, railroad, the Weldon Railroad, uh, the major uh, supply line running from the Deep South on up into Virginia. Going after Petersburg was rather like this on a smaller, more limited scale. Grant actually stole a march on Lee, one of the few commanders to ever do this, using deception, coupled with an amazing 2,200-foot pontoon bridge across the James River estuary. And if you think about this, is this is a tidal estuary, which means that it rises up and down with the tides as they shift, and that means that the pontoon bridge had to be engineered in such a way that it could rise or rise and fall smoothly with the tides. Furthermore, uh, up the James River estuary, at one end of it was Butler's Army of the James, 30,000 guys who had to be supplied continuously. And what that meant was you had to be able to take a section of the pontoon bridge out, move it out of the way, and allow for deep draft uh, vessels to go up the James River estuary to Bermuda 100 and then put it back into place uh, so that troops uh, and cannon and so forth could continue to cross. All in all, an engineering uh, marvel. Uh, a marvel of the 19th century, and I understand still an impressive uh, military feat uh, down to this day. Grant hoped to seize Petersburg by uh, a coup de main, by just you know a, a sudden, swift, decisive stroke. Uh, and so uh, in uh, June, uh, June 9th, but mainly June 15th and June 18th, uh, he attempted uh, a series of attacks at the eastern end of the, for of the uh, system of fortifications, the belt of fortifications defending Petersburg, Virginia. You can see here what these uh, fortifications uh, looked like. And although they were lightly manned, the Federal Army did not know this. They had been attacking field fortifications since the wilderness, Wilderness, Spotsylvania, to some extent at the North Anna, to their detriment uh, at Cold Harbor. And even though these these uh, these uh, parapets were lightly manned, they were very skittish about attacking them. And so they attacked them attacked them tentatively uh, and uh, in such a way that the, 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 the few Confederate troops that were available were able to hold them off long enough for Lee and his Army of Northern Virginia to realize what had ha what was happening, and to bring and for Lee to bring down uh, most of his army uh, in force. The sequel was the ten-month siege of Petersburg, which did not finally conclude until about a week before uh, Appomattox. So, what does this campaign mean? What is this, the significance of it? Why does this matter? First thing to bear in mind are the great expectations that the North had for Grant's offensive uh, in 1864. Grant, at this point, was the Union's winningest general, had, had, won, had, had uh, surrounded and captured one Confederate army at Fort Donelson, had surrounded and captured a second Confederate army uh, at Vicksburg, had driven a third Confederate army away from a seemingly impregnable uh, position at Chattanooga in November of 1863, uh, and the North expected Grant to achieve decisive results relatively, uh, relatively quickly, and the Overland Campaign disappointed uh, those hopes, and particularly the subsequent uh, siege of Petersburg disappointed uh, those hopes. So you have these great expectations that are not really uh, realized. The second thing to bear in mind is that this is all going on in the context of the 1864 uh, election. And here you have Lincoln, who achieved the, uh, the, the nomination of his party, actually called the National Union 
uh, party in June of 1864. And then you have here Jefferson Davis as the Confederate president. Both of them are obviously trying to tear the country apart. But holding it all together, George B. McClellan, who was the presumptive Democratic nominee during this period, wasn't actually nominated until late August 1864. And, of course, you know, Lincoln is saying no, you know, no, uh, no reunion without abolition or no peace without abolition. And, and Davis is saying no peace without separation. And then McClellan is saying the union must be held together at all hazards. So, you know, McClellan's a great uh, uh, patriot in all of this. Well, what's the political impact of the spring campaign of 1864? How does it actually uh, influence uh, how people are thinking and feeling about the progress of the war in 1864? No public opinion polls, so there's no way of getting at uh, what people knew about it uh, in that kind of fashion. Didn't have Gallup polls, didn't have ABC, you know, Wall Street Journal polls or whatever. However, we do have one kind of clever way of getting at a sense of what people were thinking about at the time uh, that all this stuff was going down, and that is the price of gold. A number of historians, economic historians and others, have studied uh, this issue of uh, the price of gold and have concluded that it correlates pretty well uh, to the rising and falling of Union fortunes as perceived by certain segments of the, uh, the northern population, specifically those segments of the northern population who were engaged in gold speculation. What was going on is at this particular time, greenbacks, dollars, you know, had just come into, had just come into circulation. They were legal tender for all debts, public and private. They were initially uh, such that one greenback, one paper dollar, was the same as one gold dollar, but of course, very quickly, a gold dollar became you know worth more than a greenback. And so, what you can do is you can track uh, the, the, how many uh, greenbacks it took to buy one gold dollar. And what you discover is that at the beginning of 1864, it took a dollar fifty-two uh, to buy one gold dollar. And if you track the beginning of 1864 and then during this period here, you're dealing with the Overland Campaign and also the opening uh, uh, campaigns in northern Georgia. And the, and the northern newspapers tended to report both of them almost, you know, almost as if they were one, con one, one single campaign so that Grant's, can Grant's operations and Sherman's operations you know, often got uh, covered with the same headlines, the same story, and so on. You find really... That it hasn't that that it has an impact. The price of gold rises, but the real rise, uh, the sort of the, the crisis, you know, uh, to crisis proportions occurs here during the summer. Once it has become absolutely clear that the Overland Campaign has failed in its object of defeating uh, Lee's Army of Northern Virginia, and that you, that some kind of stalemate has occurred, whose duration no one uh, can predict. By the way, does anybody you notice this, this this quick spike and then this sudden drop that occurs right here in mid July, sixty four? Anybody have any idea about what that means? Eighteen sixty four. Yes, that's exactly right. In July, in mid in, in July of eighteen sixty four. Uh, June and July of eighteen sixty four, Lee sent an entire infantry corps uh, from his army, detached it sent it to the Shenandoah Valley and then down the Shenandoah Valley into Maryland, crossed, uh, uh, started heading, south, setting, heading southeast uh, through Maryland toward Washington, fought a battle at uh, the Monocacy. By the way, there's a nice little battlefield there down by Frederick, you know, very interesting place to go. And then got to the very gates of the District of Columbia, got as far as Fort Stevens, which is now at the, uh, the extreme uh, northwestern corner of the District of Columbia. And that's when you get the spike uh, in gold prices because from the standpoint of northern public opinion, this looks very dire. To Grant, this is like there's not a whole lot of Confederate infantry. The fortifications are reasonably well held. I can get more, more reinforcements up there by sea you know, within a, within a day or so. This is not a big deal. 
to Lincoln, though, this is a big deal. And to Halleck, this is a big deal because, by the way, Halleck was responsible for coordinating the defense, and Halleck was not the kind of guy to do that kind of work. And he was, if I had hair, I would be like tearing at it right now, you know, to show what you know what, what Halleck was going through. And so politically, this was a masterstroke for Lee. This was exactly the kind of uh, of aggressive operation that Halleck was afraid Lee would, would Lee would attempt if given half a chance. And so the spike occurs as Early's raid moves through through Maryland and toward uh, toward D.C. And then the abrupt drop occurs when when Early's army falls back. So you're exactly you're exactly correct. To continue with the campaign's significance. The third area of significance has to do with the myth of the lost cause. Because although Lee defeats Grant's overland campaign, he is now sh effectively shackled to the defense of Richmond Petersburg, where with dwindling men and resources, he'll hold out for another 10 months. Now, the emphasis in this resume this Confederate resume of how things had gone had gone along uh, goes something like this: Lee fought an adroit campaign, a masterpiece of defensive maneuver against Grant uh, Grant's Army of the Potomac, out General Grant at every turn, and yet somehow or other the Confederates after the war have to explain why it's actually Lee surrendering to Grant at Appomattox and not the other way around. Not easily done, but it can be done if you have enough need to do so. Typical are the words of Edward Pollard, the editor of the Richmond Examiner and author of one of the earliest Southern histories of the war, The Lost Cause, 1866 is when it's published. Grant, Pollard writes, contained no spark of military genius. He had no conception of battle beyond the momentum of numbers. Such was the man who marshaled all the material resources of the North to conquer the little army and overcome the consummate skill of General Lee. And thus, although Grant ultimately prevailed, he did so through sheer weight of numbers. Lee outgeneraled him at every turn. This really is the origin of the idea of Grant the Butcher, Lee the Master General. And interestingly, this interpretation emerged even as the campaign was underway. Because it's, you know, one of the things when I was researching and keep moving on was I looked at, at Southern newspapers to see what they were making of the fact that Lee was retreating some 50 miles in the face of Grant's uh, offensive. Uh, and most Southerners viewed Lee's 50-mile retreat from the Rapidan to the rate gates of Richmond with relative calm. They did it by insisting, in effect, that Grant was beaten, but too stupid to recognize it. So that, for example, um, you see things like uh, in the new Southern newspapers like, Grant is beating his head against the wall, uh, or the Charleston Mercury editorial on June 10th, Grant lacks strategy, he lacks caution, he lacks versatility, and he lacks the common instinct of humanity that teaches a care for life. Grant's army, fully double that of Lee in the beginning, has now been depleted down to an equality with, if not an inferiority to, the Confederate army. Altogether, Richmond was never safer, nor the Confederate cause on higher or firmer ground than it is now. Now, As I was reading these, and many, I could, I could multiply examples of this from Southern newspapers, this reminded me of nothing so much as the Black Knight scene from Monty Python and the Holy Grail. Come on, it's only a flesh wound. So, and so what you've got then you know, emerging 
during the campaign itself is the idea of you know Grant, the unsuccessful butcher during the campaign, notwithstanding what that looks like, to the post-war interpretation, very easily done, of Grant, the successful but still unworthy butcher who won by sheer weight of numbers and, not, and certainly not by superior uh, skill. That becomes the public memory in the South of the, uh, the Virginia campaign of 1864. And public memory is something that historians talk a great deal about nowadays. It is um, it's a whole cottage industry about this, this kind of thing. And what public memory uh, has to do with is, is this. History can be critically examined, can be uh, analyzed, can be picked apart, can be argued with. Memory, on the other hand, cannot be. It is history that allows you to pick apart, say, the details of the Battle of Gettysburg. It, you're up against memory, however, if you depict the Army of Northern Virginia as an army fighting for slavery on the fields of Gettysburg. Yeah. I've got, done a lot of tours of the Battle of Gettysburg, a lot of staff rides. There's a lot of people out there are not part of the staff rides. You come and look around and you know, are listening in and so forth. Believe me. Saying that is an invitation to get slug. If you want, if you want to say, for instance, and to take a, a contemporary example, that the attacks on September 11, 2001, were in some way uh, the result of America's uh, presence in the world, things that uh, that the United States had done that uh, uh, rubbed other countries uh, the wrong the, the wrong way and produced this attack as a kind of blowback. You, you, know, you can make that argument from the standpoint of history, but, and I can already tell from the, the chilly silence in the air in this room, you know, you're up against a very powerful memory that says that this was an absolutely off-the-table atrocity, and the 3,000 lives that were lost that day in the World Trade Centers on United 93 and at the Pentagon, you know, were, the, were, were, li were the, the lives of innocent victims, full stop, end of story. Okay. So we have, uh, we have history that can be dissected and so forth, but we have memory, memory that really cannot be argued, that really cannot be argued with, and memory that changes very slowly over time. To give one further example, and then I'll move on, for a long time our memory of the American Civil War was a memory of white Americans fighting with equal valor for different but morally equivalent understandings of the American dream, the American Republic. And in order to sustain this memory, you had to submerge the memory of what? The saliency of slavery as a cause of the war, the saliency of slavery as a cause for which that brought the Confederacy into being, and you had to submerge the importance, the, cent the central importance of emancipation and the contribution made by 186,000 African Americans who fought for the Union Army on land to say nothing of about 30,000 African Americans who fought in the Union Navy uh, at sea. You had to submerge that part of the historical experience to preserve this particular memory. Well, if there is public memory, and this is the point that I want to end with tonight, there is also what I call personal memory. A great many people are interested in military history in general or, or, the, or Civil War history in particular, not because of public memory and not because of dissecting campaigns and so forth, but because of what it says to them, how it speaks to them personally as uh, individuals. And I want to talk for a few moments in uh, these, these, these uh, uh, the closing minutes of my talk in personal terms about what Robert E. Lee and Ulysses S. Grant, the two protagonists of the Overland Campaign, have meant to me personally as an example of you know, the, the kinds of personal meanings that I think most of us bring uh, to these uh, 
uh, to these events. 